Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another exciting Halloween October tour with Pretty Gritty Tours. I am your guide tonight, Chris, and it is honestly my pleasure to take you guys through the town of Stillicum. I think it has some of the creepiest stuff I've encountered in the state of Washington, in particular, the Nathaniel Orr home from 1857, which we are going to get to go inside virtually tonight and do some investigation with. And uh, on that note, I want to give a huge shout out to the Stillicum Historical Museum, uh, which is right next door to Nathaniel Orr home, right downtown Stillicum, without whom we would not have been able to do really any of this. So thanks to them. And uh, I think that's, that's the big stuff. Any of you who have been on one of these tours before, you know that uh, we're, we're delighted to be able to provide all of these virtual tours for free. And we do have a haunted tour of Bukoda. If you're not familiar with the town of Bukoda, it is way out there next to like Tanaino. And we're gonna be doing a haunted tour of that next, next week. So if you enjoy your tours and you want to show your appreciation, you can always tip your guides at prettygrittytours.com. There's a PayPal link right there. But let's let's get into this, shall we? Uh, the Nathaniel Orr home is what we're really talking about tonight. And it is in Stillicum. This is Town Hall. But the, the Orr home was built in 1857. And it has remained really pretty much untouched since it was turned into a family home. And it's only had two generations of people live in it. It was Nathaniel and his wife, Emma. They raised their kids there. Their youngest son, Glenn, took over the home from them and then continued to live in it for the rest of his life and left everything exactly where it was. But I guess I could tell you about that right here. Tonight, we are gonna go and explore the Nathaniel Orr home. Now this structure built in 1857 is the original home. He designed this as his carpentry wagon shop when he first got here and then converted it to the family home. And it's only ever had two generations of anyone inside it. First, Nathaniel and his wife, Emma, raised all their children here. And then their son, Glenn, took over ownership of the home. When he and his wife lived here, he insisted that nothing ever be moved. So everything inside the home is exactly the way that his parents had it. When he died in the 1970s, he turned over the home to the Silicon Museum here, and it has been used as part of the museum ever since. So the artifacts inside, the way that the home is laid out, everything is the way that you would have encountered it in 1857. Let's check it out inside. I think one of the things that makes the house truly spectacular and creepy is that at one point in the 90s it slid off of its foundation and was actually caught in a pear tree that Nathaniel planted in the 1850s and it was so well built you can see here that all they had to do was slide it back up onto a new foundation and the planks actually just snapped back into place. The museum has done some refurbishing to it including bringing in this is a new wallpaper but it's stylized after the original wallpaper and then they brought in all the original furniture and created the ore home again so when you're walking through here it's very much as though they've just stepped out for a moment we're going to take you in there today and you get to see this right here this is nathaniel's wagon shop he was a carpenter for the town of Stillicum. And so when he first built the home, he was actually using that as his carpentry shop. And when his wife, Emma, came out, he decided to build this wagon shop. And that's just down the hill from where the home is there today. We're also gonna get to look at some of the damage that was done when this house slid off of its foundation in the 1990s. But let's take you in. Like I said, it's not just the home that remains intact, but everything around it too. The yew trees and the fruit trees and the orchard were planted by Nathaniel when they first moved out there. To have this place on the historic registrar is 
so fitting because it's more of a time capsule than anything else. We're gonna go inside here and for my investigation in the home, I brought a lantern, my camera, and then I'm also gonna be using an EMF, an electromagnetic uh, frequency detector, just to gather any spikes. Also, uh, occasionally I'll be using a spirit box in there, which rotates through frequencies to see if anyone in the home can communicate to us electronically. So if you hear something that sounds like radio static or voices, that's what's happening there. So I'm listening to that spirit box and trying to get people to communicate with me. Now, as we enter in there, we're gonna hook to the side and there is a parlor in there. And for me, the parlor is one of the more interesting parts because like I said earlier, Glenn, when he died and actually when he lived his whole life, left it exactly the way that it was when it was his family home. And so you're looking at the, the furniture and the fixtures and the rugs that would have been in there from the late 1800s until today. And so where the rug is actually worn down, that's the way that it's been worn down over the last hundred plus years. You can take a look right here. Now, when I was in here, the front door continued to open, even though I latched it. I counted three separate occasions that it would open behind me. Now the furniture and the books and the rug, these are all from the Orr family. There's Nathaniel and Emma and this belong to them as well. If you're looking for a place in Washington state that has those artifacts that people had in their life and had for the entirety of their life, it would be more, it would be difficult to find a place better preserved than this. And Everything was attached to that family. We're going to actually take you through the home right now as well, because I think as you get deeper into the home, the energy becomes more dense. In particular, there are a couple rooms that really stood out to me. The back porch had the most noises that would continue to go on with it, uh, as well as just like weird hot and cold spots. And then as we go up into the second floor of the home, that is without a doubt the area where I have gotten the most activity and the most voices coming back on the spirit box. When we're moving around up there, uh, people that we've taken on the ghost tours that we regularly lead uh, once a year through Stillicum before the current time have said that as the evening gets later, they felt something try to push them out of the master bedroom where Nathaniel and Emma used to be. And they've heard a woman asking them first politely and then more aggressively to leave the building. So let's actually walk you through the first floor of the home right now. What's interesting about the wallpaper, that's the spirit box going on. Now, as I got closer to the portrait, sometimes the box would actually go quieter.
mostly static in the dining room, but as we start to move away, we're going to go towards the kitchen, and the kitchen had weird feedback. Um, the spirit box would click on and off. And the voices started coming through. It's more than just a display. They didn't just set this up so that you could see how they lived at the time. It's really a lot of their original possessions still there in the home. Moving back towards the kitchen there, we're going to eventually come to what would have been the wood shop for a period of time back there. Before I take you back there though, I want to take you guys briefly upstairs so that you can see the three bedrooms up there. Uh, in particular, the, the daughter's room. Now, some of the tragedy of the ores were that a few of their children did die very early on, uh, one even in their infancy. Uh, of the children that lived, like I said, Glenn, the son, continued to live in that home for the entirety of his life until he died at 93 and then turned his family home over to the museum, which now runs it as a part of their enterprise. Uh, when we're going upstairs right now, I'm going to take you into Nathaniel and Emma's master bedroom, and then I'm going to take you into the daughter's room, uh, which is a treat. I think you're going you're gonna to enjoy that part here. So let's see if I can take you in to the master. So this is Nathaniel and Emma's room, the master bedroom. This is where people have often talked about experiencing the most activity and it has so many of their things in here. So far nothing. Ooh, 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 ooh. Briefly. It's impossible to not at least a little bit feel like you're intruding. Because everything does feel like they just stepped out for a moment. Not only are they the possessions of the family, but a lot of that furniture was made by Nathaniel, and a lot of the clothing is original. Uh, some of the baby clothes that they had from their infant that passed, they actually ended up keeping in the basement and used as insulation for some of the pipes. And they have remained with the home all this time. And a lot of people theorize that these have acted sort of as anchors to members of the family because this was by far the location that they stayed the longest and they showed very little desire to move on or to change much. People all the time see things um, move around in the windows when they're walking outside, or they'll notice that the furniture gets shifted back. I think in a lot of sort of paranormal investigations, you'll see that furniture gets moved around in the middle of the night with the ore home. It's almost the opposite, where if docents leave things in locations where they haven't originally been set up, when they'll come back the next day, they'll find that that furniture is shifted back to its original place, almost like someone comes in and does housekeeping through the home in the middle of the night. We're gonna take you now into the daughter's room, which is definitely one of the ones that I got the most activity in, both on the EMF and the spirit box. The, 
closer I would get to the dolls, the more interaction I would get back. I don't know if you can hear it in the video too, but it definitely sounded like there were uh, footsteps moving around inside the home with me at this point. Now, one of the locations that I really want to take you is to the back porch. And that is the one where I absolutely, I personally got the most activity. I know that a lot of other people who've done investigations in this home uh, or have tried to communicate to anyone have found that the upstairs bedrooms were the ones that, that get the most noise or feedback to them. And I don't know if it was just because I was there alone for this or if uh, it wasn't late enough in the evening. But the back porch is the place uh, where things would start to drop down. And then there was just a great deal of uh, both feedback on the EMF and the spirit box. So let's take you guys back there really quick. I don't know if you can hear that. There's definitely... something moving back here. Hello? Previous times we've been in the home, people have talked about feeling something Feeling something upstairs, almost like someone's asking them to leave. That car alarm kept going off every time I would get closer to the edge there too. Okie doke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like every time I walk down, sound starts again. Now, fantastically, it isn't just the home that still has some residual activity to it. Just down the hill, kitty corner, basically smushed between the museum and the orchard is the wagon shop. And it's the original Nathaniel Orr wagon shop as well. Now, I'm gonna take you guys down there. Now, uh, fair warning, it has got some of the weirdest stuff that happens on on all of my investigations while we're down there. Uh, and then from the wagon shop, I'm gonna actually take you guys through the remainder of that sort of downtown area and still come there because there's a surprising amount of lore and haunted activity in a very condensed area, but it is one of the oldest parts of our, of our area out here. So it makes sense. So let's actually take you guys to the wagon shop really quick.
Okay. Uh, for that, I apologize. That's the only one I'm going to do tonight. But it wouldn't have been a true ghost tour if I didn't at least put something in there. <clears throat> I promise. I'm going to take you back to the wagon shop now, and it's going to be legit. So why did so this is the spirit box recording I got from the wagon shop and the docents at the museum said that they've seen this guy back here move around sometimes. Without a doubt, it's that that back room of the home, that back porch there, and the wagon shop that have given me the weirdest vibes of anything that I was out investigating out there. But what I really want to take you guys down to is now one of, I think, the most well-known, as far as uh, ghost story stuff in the area, locations in downtown Stillicum. So let's take you down to Bear Drugstore. Now today, uh, Bear Drugstore is a super, like really classy breakfast place, probably one of the best breakfasts in Washington state, certainly in the South Sound region. But it has operated as a ton of different things in its history. It was the streetcar stop for a long period of time. It was a diner. It was a drug store. It was a general store. And it was the post office as well. Today, aside from being this and, um, you know, a, a dining location, it is also a small museum for the city of Stillicum. This is the streetcar as it was coming up here. And it said that they would know that it was starting to come because when it would try and push up that hill there, the lights would dim in the bare drugstore because the streetcar would pull extra electricity for that moment to come up the hill. So they knew they had a few minutes to prepare for the influx of customers that were about to arrive. This location lends itself a little bit to the tragedy of the bare drugstore. We know that in the 1930s, someone escaped from Western State Hospital and they made their way to the Stillicum area, which was absolutely the closest place that you could go if you left the mental hospital there. They arrived here at the Bear Drug Hardware Store and along seen uh, cans of salmon sauce get thrown off the shelves and they'll just see like a shadow of someone sitting in there every now and then. I managed to get some footage in where, while we were there and I don't know that you can pick anything up, but I'll leave it up to you guys. Now it's right back here next to the potbelly stove that people have told me they've seen someone just sitting, waiting in the middle of the night. Now I didn't catch anything on camera this time, but previous times that I've been leading the tour, it looks like there's just someone sitting in the dark back there. Now you can see the original counter right here, and then at the back there, which we'll see in a second, are the post boxes when this used to operate as the post office. Take you to the back of the building here really quick so that you can see in the window. Now it's on that far wall that people often say that they've seen objects fall down. Or what's really strange to me is that people who have been working here late at night say that they'll hear what sounds like all the pots and pans of the kitchen fall down, but they'll go back to the kitchen area and everything is exactly where they left it. 
<clears throat> What's interesting about Bear Dragon Hardware, other than the fact that it's got this haunted history, is that it's just across the street from perhaps the most famously haunted location in downtown Stillicum, which is, I hope some of you already know, the E.R. Rogers home. Now, E.R. Rogers was very wealthy at the time and created this incredible mansion for himself and his wife back in the day. But during the financial collapse in the late 1800s, they lost everything and were forced to sell the home here. They never got to live in it. For the entire time that they lived in Stillicum, they were just in a small house immediately next door. And Mrs. Rogers, never got to move into her dream mansion and got to see it turned into a hotel, a boarding house, a den of ill repute, uh, among various other things. Eventually it became a steakhouse, but over all those years, people have repeatedly talked about seeing what looks like the shape of just a woman wandering around inside the home. And what's interesting is when it was a steakhouse, people would say that they would see essentially from the waist down legs, walking across the ceiling and that they think what happened is that during the remodel they moved the second floor up a little bit higher to make it more lofted and grand and that this woman is still walking around on the second floor of the home that she never got to enjoy we're gonna take a quick look at it here and see if we can see anything Now, people have always told me that they'll be walking downtown in Stilicum and see a woman on the second floor looking out of this window up there and that she never looks pleased. There's the house where they end up living out the rest of their days. Now it isn't just this tragedy that lingers on the streets out there. One of the most well-documented cases of vigilante justice in Washington state actually happened just up the street from here. And let's see. Here. Today, do the ghosts of Bird and Bates wander the streets of Stillicum? It's a topic of hot debate. This, just two blocks up from the Nathaniel Orr home is the site of the first Washington Territorial Jail. And it is, in my opinion, definitely one of the more haunted areas out there. What's interesting is a lot of people go back and forth on this. But what we do know for sure is that back in the day, at this location right here in 1863, there was a guy named Andrew Bird. And Andrew Bird was really well liked in the area. He was part of the, the Bird dynasty that put up a lumber mill and a grist mill and just created a lot of jobs and economic prosperity in the area. And then there was a guy who was mentally slow uh, by the name of J.B. Bates uh, or J.M. Bates. And Bates had only one possession that he cared about, and it was this cow. And he would sell the milk from the cow to make his living. And one day the cow goes missing and he gets it in his head that Andrew Bird is the guy who stole it. So he waits for like a week, just getting angrier and angrier, hoping to find his cow, never do, never finding it until eventually he shoots Bird through the stomach. A day later, Andrew Bird dies and they take J.M. Bates into custody here at that first territorial jail. Unfortunately, because Bird was so well liked, everyone in the town, hundreds of people rallied together. They went to this jail site, disarmed the sheriff, ripped the door off of the building, took him to a nearby barn, and then lynched Bates. Now, like I said, this is one of the more well-documented cases of vigilante justice in Washington state, and people have put it in their memoirs. People covered a lot of this story. What's less well-confirmed is that for a long period of time there, people said that they've seen the ghost of a man 
carrying a noose and a leader for a cow just randomly wandering around downtown Stillicum. I've never seen him personally, but I have on multiple occasions heard what sounds like a cow in downtown Stillicum out there. One thing that I think is particularly interesting is that this is also just a block away from another one of the truly, I'm gonna say bizarre stories in the area out here, the story of the Balches. So this right down here in downtown Stillicum is the Balch House. And this is another historically preserved property because this is almost exactly what you would have seen when the Balch brothers moved in. Uh, Albert and Lafayette were brothers. And what's fascinating about their story here is that one of the Balch brothers uh, was very sane. And believe it or not, this picture is of him. He was a sea captain who went back and forth between Tacoma and California, and he was creating a lot of industry and is one of the founders of the town of Stilica. His brother, however, suffered from lunacy. And essentially every full moon, he would just become incredibly violent and crazy. At one point, they tried to send him down to California so that he could actually get treatment for his illness. But on the journey, the phase of the moon changed. And by the time he arrived in California, he was a perfectly rational guy. So much so that the ship he was on witnessed another ship get struck and fall, start to sink. He actually jumped overboard and helped save several of the people who were drowning at that time. They sent him back to Tacoma saying that he was perfectly physically and mentally fit. And when he arrived back in the Stilicum area, he went mad again. It got to the point where Balch would keep his brother inside the home locked up every full moon until one night he was away on business and he left his brother in the caretaker's hands. They forgot to lock the door and he escapes. They find him two days later, frozen to death in the woods, naked, holding nothing but an ax. And now people reportedly see what looks like a naked man or a shadowy figure running around in the woods outside of the Stilicum area. For me, it's one of those stories that definitely pricks up the hair on the back of your neck when you're talking about it down there. Stillicum has a very heavy vibe to it when you're doing the ghost tour in the middle of the night. And I think for me, no place elicits that response more than the Nathaniel or home and this shed out in the woods. So if you walk essentially due east from the or home down the street there, as the street turns, if you look down into the gully, you'll see this shed. There is no confirmation as to what this is. Uh, it's believed that it could be a pump house taking water from the creek there. It's also believed that it might have operated as an illegal still during the Prohibition era. What I've been told repeatedly and have at one time seen myself is that there is the entity of a child that lingers around down there. And you can just see them sometimes run through the trees. And what's even weirder is hear it. Sounds like twigs are snapping when they're running around down there. The best thing that I can determine about this is that there was at one point, perhaps in the late 70s, early 80s, someone who drowned down there while they were a child and that they might still be lingering to this location. Before we do anything here, I wanna take you guys briefly back into the ore home. For me, Stillicum has always had an air of mystery about it, but the longer I've been doing the ghost tours out here, the more there just feels something sticky about it. And the more pictures that come back, the more footage I've seen of lights just turning on or off or swinging on their own, there's definitely more credence that I give to the theory that the Nathaniel Orholm in particular has something lingering in it. I don't think it's malicious, but there is definitely something stuck there. The toys up here in the third bedroom, the boys' bedroom, have been known to rearrange themselves on more than one occasion. Personally, I think the Bear Drugstore and the E.R. Rogers home have more frequent 
and aggressive activity, but I think it's the ores that still stay here in this home. Hopefully, you get the opportunity to decide for yourselves here in the future. Uh, I want to extend a hearty and very sincere uh, thank you to the Silicon Historical Museum Association for letting us go and tour these sites and to get footage of the ore home and in a time where people really can't go anywhere or do anything, let you guys get to experience something a little more. Next week, we are gonna be doing the uh, virtual tour of Bukota, and we are gonna be going through a graveyard uh, around a haunted gym and then to the Devil's Tree, which has, I think, the best footage that we captured down there. As always, if you've enjoyed your tour and you would like to show your appreciation, you can always tip your guide uh, on the homepage of prettygrittytours.com. We have a PayPal link just down the page there, right above the About Us video. Uh, and it's helping us keep the lights on as we offer these virtual tours in uncertain times. <sighs> so hopefully, I see you guys very soon. If you have any recommendations of places you'd like to experience in the Washington State Arena, please let me know. We're always game for a challenge. But I appreciate you guys joining me tonight. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. We will always do our best to answer them. So until next time, my friends, I'm your guide, Chris, encouraging you to keep on exploring.